I left Solomon Brothers, and I set up my fund called the Hermitage Fund. And I went back to all of these um, famous guys who I met on Wall Street, and I said, would you be willing to invest with me in my Hermitage Fund? And um, one of the guys who I'd met was a, a very famous, um, now deceased man named Edmund Safra. He was the owner of Republic National Bank in New York. And in the world of private banking, his name was as good as it ever, his name was like a, he was a legend in private banking. You might not know about him now, but if you knew the history of, of, of wealth and private banking, this man was just like gold. And Edmund Safra put up the first $25 million to be my anchor investor. We became joint venture partners. And he said, if you do a good job, um, uh, with this 25 million, then I will introduce you to all the rich people in the world and we'll make you into a spectacular success. But you need to do a good job first. So I moved to Moscow from London in 1996 and um, started investing. And it was really a, a very um, interesting thing because um, in 1996, there was not a single um, Wall Street educated in principal investor who was actually sitting on the ground in Russia. There was a lot of Wall Street principal investors sitting on the ground in Wall Street, and there was a lot of Wall Street educated brokers sitting on the ground in Moscow, but no investors. And it was very interesting because the brokers would all write research about things that they could make a lot of commissions buying and selling. Um, and they wouldn't write research about the things that made the most sense. And so basically you end up in a situation where anything, any stock that was researched by the, by the brokers would trade at 10 times the valuation of any stock in the same industry that wasn't researched by the brokers, and nobody had any confidence in buying the stuff that wasn't researched because they couldn't do any research. So again, this is not rocket science, this is just simple, simple stuff. I thought, well, here I am on the ground, I can do my own research, why don't I go visit the company that trades at one-tenth the valuation of the other one where there's a research report? So I went and visited the oil company that traded at one-tenth the valuation of Luke Oil, and a couple of them that did. And I looked at them, and there was no difference between the ones that were one-tenth evaluation, except for the fact that there wasn't a Credit Suisse research report. So after going through these companies and realizing that they're exactly the same, they had the same surly management, the same rusting oil derricks, the same bad <laughs> tax inspectors, the same everything, one was 10 times cheaper than the other. And by the way, the one that was 10 times more expensive was still one-tenth evaluation of the Western oil companies. So these are trading at one one-hundredth evaluation of the Western oil companies. So, I decided I'm going to invest in the stuff that's unresearched because I can do my own research. So I did my own research, invested in them, and my fund went up in the first month of operations, it went up 35%. Not, not in a year, but in a month. So some of Edmund Safra's clients had heard about that he was into this hot new thing in Russia and wanted to get involved, and they called up Edmund and said, can we um, invest in your fund? He said, no, 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 we don't know this guy. He could be stupid, he could be a crook, we have no idea. We, I want to audit, I want to have like a year's track record, audits, everything, and then I'll let everybody in, but I don't want to put my name next to his until I know for sure that he's, he's a, a solid guy. The next month we were up 40%. <laughs> and the guys who had called him said, Edmund, what are you trying to do? You're, that was 40% we would have made if we had invested. And, and, and people were getting angry with him and said, listen, Edmund, we're going to take some of our money out of your bank if you're being so greedy and not letting us into this thing, just keeping it for yourself. And he couldn't have imagined that his business risk was not going to be me blowing up and me doing too well. And so all these people were going to threatening to leave his bank because I had done so well and he wouldn't let him in. And so he relented, opened up the fund for outside investors. And by the end of the first year, we had about $100 million under management. We were up like 150%. Um, the next year was even better. Um, we were up 200 and I think we were up 242% um, in, in 1997. Um, we were up 800% from when we launched 18 months earlier. My fund was over a billion dollars. Again, this is when a billion dollars really meant something. And I was the largest investor by, by any stretch of the imagination in a small market. They were writing articles about how clever I was on the front page of the New York Times. My clients were inviting me to their yachts. <laughs> I was in my early 30s. I thought, that, I thought I've just figured it all out. I, and I had no perspective. I, I mean, everything that I've just told you was like, you know, one of them by themselves might not have been a sell signal, but, you know, a young guy in his 30s with the biggest fund in a market, up 800% in 18 months, clients and yachts, front page articles, that is a sell signal if there ever was one. <laughs> but I was too young and too inexperienced to understand that. In 1997, the... the um, 
uh, Asian currencies started to devalue. Um, uh, Asian markets started to go down. The, Russians, uh, the, Russian bond, the Russian government had a huge debt burden. It was rolling on a three-month basis with hedge funds and, and rich guys. And um, they couldn't roll it over. Russia defaulted, devalued. The stock market went down 88%. My one billion went down to 100 million. <clears throat> there was no more yachts invitations after that. <laughs> but then I discovered something far more um, disturbing than losing 90% of your money which was that the, the, the companies that I invested in, which were basically oil and gas companies in Russia, were run by people who, you've now, um, who are now sort of properly immortalized, uh, uh, the Russian oligarchs. These, these a small group of about 22 guys basically owned a majority of all these companies. And they used to behave themselves a little bit when they thought they, had a, they, they, they needed access to Western capital, when the Western capital markets were open. But after the Russian um, economy defaulted and devalued and everything went... Uh, to hell, um, there was no more Western investors in any case, and so they no longer had any need to um, behave themselves. And so in 1998 and 1999, the Russian oligarchs embarked on an orgy of stealing that's been unprecedented in the history of business. I mean, it's just remarkable. Every type of scam you could ever imagine they were trying to do, asset stripping, transfer pricing, dilution, embezzlement, you name it, they were doing it. And I was owning one or two percent of these companies and just watching all the money that the companies had just disappearing. And so I had to decide something. I either, either was going to stay there and just put up with all this stuff, or I was going to have to, um, uh, uh, I mean, well, I mean ba basically, there, there, was, there, was, there was really only two choices. You could either leave or you could fight. I mean, I, I, I could not just watch it happen. And so we decided to fight. And... Um, and the most famous fight um, involved Gazprom. And uh, Gazprom is a company that no one had really heard of in the West um, until like 10 years ago. But, uh, and Gazprom, um, is, it's the biggest gas company in the world. It's about 10 times the size of Exxon in terms of um, uh, hydrocarbon reserves. And Gazprom, in 1999, was trading at a 99.7% discount to BP or Exxon per barrel of hydrocarbon reserves. Why, why was it at such a big discount? Because everybody thought that everything, that everything was being stolen out of Gazprom. So I looked at this thing and I said to myself, could they really be stealing everything out of Gazprom? That would be just the most remarkable thing, a company 10 times the size of Exxon, everything being stolen. So I got together with my um, team and I said, let's do a stealing analysis of Gazprom. And they looked at me, how do you do a stealing analysis? So, <laughs> So we, th we started thinking, well, how do you do a stealing analysis? And, and uh, as I said <laughs> in the introduction, um, they, don't, they didn't teach me this at Stanford Business School. Um, you couldn't go to the company and say how much he's stealing. <laughs> um, because they wouldn't tell you. <laughs> that might do worse things. You couldn't go to the brokers because the brokers are so busy preening themselves in front of Gazprom to get co corporate finance work that the last thing they would do is tell anybody how much stealing was going on. Um, but I learned something as a consultant at the Boston Consulting Group, which is um, if you want to find out the answer to something which is not written down somewhere, you just go and interview people. That's what the consultants do, for any of you who are thinking about consulting. And um, so I said, let's make a list of all the people who know about stealing a gas problem and just ask them to breakfast, lunch, dinner, tea, coffee, and see what we can learn from interviewing them. We didn't know whether anyone would accept our invitations or tell us anything, but why not try? So we set up about 40 of these meals, and most people accepted the invitation. Why not? And we discovered something very interesting, is that in the communist days, the richest person in Russia was maybe 10 times richer than the poorest person. But by 1999, the richest person in Russia was like 250,000 times richer than the poorest person. And that just poisoned the whole environment of the country. Everyone just hated everybody else and hated the rich people and hated the people that stole and so people were, in these meetings were spilling their guts out to us about all the different scams they knew about. We were filling up notebooks with all these different allegations of scams. It was interesting, really interesting stuff that people were telling us, writing it all down. We filled up a whole notebook with these allegations. But how do you know any that this stuff is true? You know, a lot of sour grapes. Now, Russia has one other great um, interesting anomaly, which is it's got to be the most bureaucratic country in the world. 
everything that ever happens in Russia gets filed in quadruplicate in four different ministries. And you go to the bathroom, you have to write down, and then some ministry like um, registers it. And so, and, and what's interesting is that you can just go and ask for the information. It's just a question of like going to the ministry. And so one of my guys, one of, uh, one of the guys who works for me, my head of research, started going around to different ministries, picking up databases on different things. And we were able to take these databases we got from the ministries and cross-reference them with all the stuff we learned in these breakfast, lunches, and dinners. And we learned exactly how much had been stolen from Gazprom by who, in what way. And basically what we learned um, was that nine individuals from management of Gazprom had stolen um, an oil company the size of Exxon out of Gazprom. That's pretty dramatic. I mean, it's the size of Kuwait. The oil reserves the size of Kuwait had been stolen out of Gazprom. Um, but we also um, learned that um, uh, the oil company the size of, of Kuwait is, is only 9% of Gazprom's reserves. 91% was still there. So what do you do if the market's pricing something as if there's a 99.7% discount and um, you just discovered uh, that really there should only be a 10% discount. You go and buy the hell out of the thing. And that's what we did. We made Gazprom our single largest investment. That's usually where a fund manager would stop. But we said to ourselves, this is just so morally outrageous what these guys have done. And it's so obvious. Let's share this information with the world. <laughs> and so we did. Um, we, we broke it into seven chapters. I gave a chapter to the Financial Times, a chapter to the Wall Street Journal, a chapter to the New York Times, Business Week. And each of them wrote a story. And boy, did that set the M Moscow night on fire. <laughs> there were parliamentary hearings. There were, there were shareholder votes. There was articles, more articles, more hearings, investigations. And about seven months later, uh, Putin, who had become president in, in uh, 1999, stepped in, fired the, the um, head of Gazprom, um, put a new guy in who said his responsibility was to, to recover the lost assets and not let any more Gazprom assets leave the company. And from the moment that we started this thing until 2005, the, sh the stock price was up 100 times. <laughs> We got so excited by this that we started doing it elsewhere. We did it at the Unified Energy Systems, the National Electricity Company. Uh, we did it at Spearbank, the National Savings Bank. Um, we did it at um, Surgot Neftegas. And it was working like a charm. Not everything was as, as remarkable as Gazprom, but it was all pretty, pretty amazing. Um, the fund went up something like 40 times from, from uh, uh, we went from 100 million to more than uh, four billion. I became the largest investor in Russia. Um, it was just amazing.